space folks and space enthusiasts out there that get mad at me for saying this, but failure is an option. This team is building a hypersonic autonomous test plane that will go over 3,000 miles per hour. We are pushing the envelope. With the ultimate goal of making passenger airplanes six times faster than they are today. Success is a possible outcome. Is it the most likely outcome? No. We just keep moving, keep moving little bit by bit until we will this into existence. We are in Atlanta, Georgia right now on location at Hermius, which is a hypersonic aircraft company. They're building a aircraft which can travel five times the speed of sound. And I'm just like super excited to check it out. I should add, I'm super excited because I actually studied aerospace engineering in college. Yes, your typical first step to storytelling, I know. That's, that's my voice. Yeah. Anyways, I really geek out on this stuff. So what you see behind me is Quarter Horse. This is the first aircraft that we're building here at Hermius, and it'll be the first aircraft to break a speed record in, in almost 50 years. Hermius' first demonstrator aircraft, the Quarter Horse, is a small, single-engine, autonomous vehicle designed to do two major things. Touch Mach 5 ever so briefly to collect data and to test their Chimera engine. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Quarter Horse. We're not just building one quarter horse uh, in this development program, we're actually building three. So that allows us to, to take that type of risk in flight tests that normally would not be possible. The other kind of key thing that, that enables that is the fact that quarter horse uh, is autonomous. There are no people on board. Hypersonic flight isn't new. The X-15, forerunner of today's spacecraft and tomorrow's airplanes. See how these planes are being dropped mid-flight from another airplane? They're powered by rockets. That's how we've been achieving hypersonic for the last 50 years. But Hermes is trying to do something different. Build an aircraft that can take off from sea level, hit hypersonic speeds, and land to be reused all while using one jet engine. The way you would design an aircraft to take off and land, and an engine to do that, is kind of at the opposite end of a spectrum from the optimum high-speed aircraft. You have all these different uh, kind of constraints pulling you in different directions. So you have to make all these design compromises to get something that can both take off, break the sound barrier, and accelerate it at high speed, all, all in one set of hardware. An example of this is with a high-speed aircraft like the X-15 that has a wing designed to reduce drag at increased speeds. But at lower speeds, those same features are undesirable because they reduce lift. The actual quarter horse vehicle, the challenges with it are we're trying to build something as small as possible to prove out that we can hit Mach 5. This is Danielle. She's the head engineer of Quarter Horse. We have to be kind of equally bad at everything. If we're really good at going fast, we'll have a really hard time going through that transonic region. We won't be able to get through it and we'll be stuck at Mach 1.2. Supersonic flight is anything above the speed of sound, referred to as Mach 1, about 760 miles per hour at sea level. Hypersonic flight is anything above Mach 5, five times the speed of sound, which is about 3,800 miles per hour at sea level. Today, your standard commercial jet moves you from New York to LA at about 500 miles per hour. You guys have a landing gear because you're taking off from the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and that's unique. Yeah. You know, you're not just like dropping this from. Yeah. Oh, it would make it so aircraft. much easier if we could if just you didn't drop have to deal it. with yeah. it. Yeah, if we gear. didn't have to land the thing, it would be so much easier. Yeah. Heat is one of the really unique challenges about yes. hypersonic. Can you tell me about that? We're targeting a, a reusable hypersonic vehicle. Our approach is to have high temperature materials so that we have what's called a hot structure. To withstand the high temperatures of re-entry, the space shuttle was covered with ceramic tiles that could be damaged and replaced, but that kept the substructure safe. In space, there's no air, so a spacecraft is free to accelerate unencumbered by air friction. But inside Earth's atmosphere, the faster you go, the more air friction causes the surface of the aircraft to heat up. If this were in the air, yeah. traveling at Mach 5, yep. and I were to touch it, You'd it would be approximately... Eight or 900 Eight degrees. or 900 degrees. Yeah. And at the front, at the front... The very front will be 2,000. 2,000 yeah. degrees. That's really hot. The metal grows at, at those temperatures. Just heating everything up to the right temperatures is going to create load on the vehicle that you have to be able to react. Whoa. Yeah. Quarter Horse will be a terrible subsonic aircraft, and it'll also kind of be like a terrible hypersonic aircraft, but its job is to bridge that gap so we can get the data we need to learn so that we can actually build a really good hypersonic aircraft in the next one with Dark Horse. Of all the challenges of going zero to hypersonic, building an engine capable of that range of speeds might be the hardest. 
On a typical airplane, you'll see the engine kind of hang off the bottom of the wing. Our fuselage, our whole aircraft is wrapped around our engine. Okay, so this right here. This is where the engine would live. Yeah. The back end of it is, is right here, and you can see some of our uh, thermal protection systems a little crunchy. Yeah. Because um, we fired an engine in here. <laughs> yeah. um, a normal jet engine produces thrust by compressing air, adding fuel, igniting that mixture, and accelerating it through a nozzle. At higher speeds, a different type of jet is required, something called a ramjet. They're an incredibly simple device. From a thermodynamic perspective, they do exactly the same thing as the traditional jet engine does, which is compress air, burn it, and exhaust it through a nozzle. Instead of having a mechanical compressor like you have on a jet engine, it actually uses a natural compression mechanism called a shockwave. As a plane moves through the air faster than the speed of sound, airwaves in front of it pile up, creating what's called a shock wave. As shock waves naturally compress the supersonic airflow inside a ramjet, there's no need for a mechanical compressor. So really all you have is, is an inlet that compresses the air naturally, a combustor where you're putting fuel into the, uh, into the flow and burning it. Our air breathing propulsion is actually the entire length of the vehicle. So from the tip of the aircraft where we have the inlet section, it goes all the way to the back where we have the, the nozzle. So we went from idea and to building this thing in about four months. Four, four months? months? Yeah, from zero to drawings to putting the whole thing together. Since Hermius's aircraft will be taking off and landing from the ground, their engine needs to work as a standard jet engine and then transition to operating as a ramjet only once at higher speeds. The trick with ramjets is that they don't work until you're flying about Mach 2 or, or above. They don't get real efficient until you get to about Mach 3. So jet engines you know, tend to work up to about Mach 2-ish. So there's this kind of gap between the two that you have to bridge in, in one way or another. Hermius argues that each of the component technological capabilities they need have been in existence for decades. The challenge is bringing them all together. We're taking an approach that is like fundamentally focused on engineering and not science. We're not inventing any new materials, we're not inventing any new propulsion systems. Engineers are a bunch of nerds that don't like talking to other people. <laughs> Help me, what are we looking at? So What's we're looking going on? at um, two J85 engines. We name our engines, this is Amelia. Amelia? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we're taking this, the core turbine section, the part that spins, to do the, the lower speed portions of flight. All of this comes off and we put our own afterburner. Oh, okay, on. okay. Yeah. It takes years and years to build yeah. one of these and, and we showed in the seed round that we can take a commercial jet engine, pull off its afterburner, put our own afterburner on, and run it way high at way higher speeds than it's designed for. An afterburner, as the name suggests, sits at the end of a jet. It adds more fuel to the exhaust coming through the jet and ignites it, producing even more thrust and allowing the aircraft to travel at even greater speeds. How we transition from a turbojet engine at low speed to a ramjet engine at high speed, uh, that's something that's never been done in flight. Uh, so we'll do it in a wind tunnel on the ground, and then we'll have to do it in flight with quarter horse. That's a big risk. All right, all right, all right. Whoa, this is really big. Yeah, uh, so this is our turbo-based combined cycle engine, Chimera. Um, so the Chimera engine is the engine that powers it, and it's designed to operate from not moving on the grounds up to you know, Mach 4 to 5 up at about 80 to 90,000 feet. Gas turbine engine does its magic, right? Uh, pumping the air into the afterburner during the um, you know, lower speed Mach 0 to Mach um, you know, 3 range. We'll bypass that air around. Uh, there's multiple fuel circuits. There's a flame holder in here that you can't see, uh, but then a combustion chamber and then a 2D nozzle. So air comes in here and, right. and runs through here until you get to Mach about Mach 3. About Mach, About Mach 3. 3. Right. And, and then the air passes around this and goes straight into the afterburners. That's right. And so we dual use the afterburner as a ram, uh, ramjet. So it's what, it's what we call a ram burner. I'm going to say got it because I think I got it. <laughs> but that was all very, very technical stuff. Uh, you're clearly very smart, Glenn. Uh, thank you for breaking that down for us. You're welcome. Hermes has successfully tested their Chimera engine over 100 times including for elected officials late last year. We were supposed to see a test when we visited. Instead, we had a chance to chat with the co-founders about an engine test failure that happened off camera while we were on site. <laughs> Just who you wanted to see, right? A film crew. So what happens if Quarter Horse crashes next year? 
<laughs> well, it's not an if, it's probably a when. We're going to push the bounds of what the aircraft can do in flight. We fully expect to lose an aircraft at some point in, in the development program. You know, there are any number of different types of failures that we could have in flight that could cause, you know, catastrophic loss of the vehicle. It's a single engine vehicle, so we can lose flight control, exceed the limits of tens or hundreds of pounds of, of difference the between the thrust and the drag of the aircraft. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there's, there's no shortage of, of challenges, uh, you know, here. Whatever you want to share, it's, it's pretty interesting to us and cool that you're being open about, hey, not everything is easy. Yep. But yeah, just tell me like what, what, what happened? What's going on? Are you cool, comfortable, like just rolling on it? Uh, a lot of things can happen when you're testing, you know, energetic systems and things like that. We push in the limits of what it could do. Uh, chucked a little bit of uh, hardware out the back end and burned some uh, grass out the back, so no big deal. We just had to call the, the fire department to come put out the uh, brush fire, but that was about it. A jet needs to constantly combust new air as it's coming through. This requires a continuous flame. The flame holder, that piece of equipment that got chucked out the back of the Chimera, is a part within the engine that prevents that flame from going out. As Hermius was testing their engine right before we arrived on site, it broke. You know, whenever you lose a piece of hardware, it can seem like really, really bad, but given the way that we did it, um, it was very intentional. This was specifically a component that we saw um, indications that it wasn't sufficient, and so we wanted to see and push the life on it. We have the replacement hardware in work. Um, we're gonna replace it relatively quickly. There's a certain set of stakes when we're doing this on the ground, um, but it's exactly what we're gonna be doing when we're in the air as well. We use a little bit of... It's still kind of hot. Oh, it's definitely warm from, yeah. from test. Yeah. So I can't see the flamethrower because it's... Oh, flame holder, yeah. Out there. <laughs> oh, yeah, you, exactly. A day and a half after the accident saw the airframe in its original jigs at the factory. The damage that seemed crippling was quickly repaired and the broken halves rejoined. Just the willingness to try and the willingness to fail. We haven't had that in hypersonics development, at least since the pre-space shuttle days. Back then, we were willing to fail a lot. I mean, we, we broke an X-15 in half, and then we put it back together and flew it again. Um, we'd never do that today. And even from failures, lessons are learned. I love what you were saying in the interview about the X-15 and like how like people haven't been willing to really push the, brown, the bounds and break stuff. Mm -hmm. like what you guys are trying to do is move fast, and things are going to break. There's going to be failure. That's a necessary part yep. of really innovating at this speed. It only works, though, if you're moving fast enough and you've built enough hardware that you can get back into tests quickly. Because mm -hmm. um, if, if you haven't, you haven't prepared for that failure, then it's going to take you a much longer time to return. And you're also going to be a little bit less willing to take risk and fail the next time. One thing that Hermia says makes their approach different is their reliance on a vertical integration process modeled after ones used by private space companies. Hypersonic aircraft are incredibly coupled systems. One small change can have large implications on the overall vehicle performance or what the power system needs to do. It's really hard to design kind of one part by itself and then put everything together. You have to design the whole thing at the same time. And vertical integration allows you to continue to make trades across the interfaces between those systems, not from the very beginning when you don't know a lot about it, but all along the way as you're, as you're developing it, as you're building it, as you're manufacturing it, as you're flying it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard Hermes Flight 1025 with nonstop service between JFK and Tokyo. Were you a flight attendant in the, you know, <laughs> no. in another life? <laughs> maybe, no? maybe. Yeah. <laughs> if Hermes can pull this off and build their 20 passenger aircraft, the Halcyon, maybe you're wondering, what will hypersonic flight be like? There won't be any windows because of the extreme heat on the outside of the aircraft. Instead, Passengers will see the curvature of the Earth and some darkness of space thanks to high-res camera feeds projected onto LED screens on the cabin walls. What about... that? The sonic boom that happens when an aircraft breaks the sound barrier. After Air Force testing over Oklahoma City in the 1960s led to tens of thousands of complaints, the FAA banned civil overland supersonic flight. It's one of the factors that complicated Concorde's ability to stay in business. The one thing that has changed since Concorde's days is that the number of passengers traveling on overwater routes has grown substantially. The market is large enough just on those overseas routes to sustain a couple of different competitors, probably. I think it's safe to say that most people don't find air travel to be luxurious. We put up with it because it gets us where we want to go relatively quickly, which makes the promise of hypersonic flight 
all the more exciting. While there are other startups like Boom and Eon focused on getting passenger travel back up to supersonic speed, Hermius, with the money it's raised, its contract with the Air Force, and less risk-averse approach, seems to be right now the most legitimately positioned private company to achieve hypersonic commercial flight. It was an air show that I went to in middle school that kind of really set me on my path. I saw a C-5 Galaxy fly. So it's one of the largest cargo aircraft that, that we have in the U.S. Air Force. And it, it just kind of broke my brain <laughs> to see something like the size of a building flying just didn't make sense to me. It's like, okay, I got to figure out how they did that. I firmly believe that that face-to-face -face communication is kind of the key to humanity. This is one of the fastest airplanes ever built. We have a lot of challenges that, that we have to solve as a species to open access to the world and really make it regional is really a key to kind of unlocking the potential of, of what humanity can do. What Hermius is attempting is a moonshot. Bigger companies like Boeing have been at it for decades. What was inspiring about talking to the team at Hermius was how clear-eyed they are about their potential for failure, yet in spite of that, how determined they are to pull this off. I'll put it this way. Failure is still the most likely outcome. And every day, that inches a little bit closer to success. And there'll be days when we go the other direction, where we learn something we didn't know, where we fail in a test and, and we take a step back. I don't see a way where this isn't physically possible. Now it comes down to execution. So we're here on set. Uh, what's up, man? At Hermius, uh, now I feel like a presenter now. Sunglasses or no sunglasses? I'm not live. I'm, I'm here. I'm live. Coming to you live and direct.